Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, hello, everybody. It is Wednesday night and it is time for Friends in Fiction. So let's get rolling. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be welcoming Deneen Milner, the author of One Blood, and Jessica Ward, the author of The St. Ambrose School for Girls. Make sure that you check out all the pieces of our Friends and Fiction community at friendsandfiction.com. There you'll find links to everything Friends and Fiction, our weekly Friday podcast that drops on all major podcast platforms, our bookshop.org page, which supports indie bookstores where our books and books from our guests are available at a discount, our newsletter, and our Friends and Fiction official book club with Brenda and Lisa. And speaking of, the book club is meeting on their separate Facebook page this coming Monday, September 18th at 7 p.m. to talk to Abby Jimenez about her novel, Yours Truly. And on last week's podcast, Mary Kay and Ron talked to Craig Johnson about the Longmire Defense that debuted on the New York Times list today yep. and is part of the very Netflix famous Longmire series. And coming this Friday, Christy and Ron will be talking to Nina Simon about Mother Daughter Murder Night, which is such a great title and is the newest Reese pick. I love it. And Mary Kay, we are just two weeks out from the release of Bright Lights, Big Christmas. I cannot believe it. How are we two weeks out? I know. I'm (laughs) wise. Mary Kay, what can you tell us about how to celebrate the release with you and where we can find you on the road? Well, there's a big launch party in Atlanta, and you can still buy tickets to that. It's at Huff Harrington Home, which is a fabulous um, home store. Um, There's a launch party in Buena Vista, Georgia, in southwest Georgia, um, near Columbus. Um, We're having a tea, a Christmas tea in Savannah. But all the details are are on my website. Um, And you really want to pre-order the book, like now, like Stop watching and go, you know, order the book. That's right. You can order it, <laughs> pre-order it from Eagle Eye Books and Decatur. And when you do that, you'll get a signed, personalized book, plus a limited edition spammy Christmas ornament. Spammy's the little trailer in the book while supplies last. So all the details of my events, plus ticketing event links where they're needed, are on my website at MaryKAndrews.com. And I thank our whole friends and family, friends and fiction family, that's hard to say, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I think, I don't know about you guys, but I'm used guys. <laughs> I'm excited about our uh, la- live launch event on Wednesday, October 4th in Westminster, Maryland. All four of us, plus Ron and Meg, will be together live on stage at the theater at Carroll Community College, hosted by the indie bookstore, A Likely Story, and the Carroll County Library. Tickets are nearly sold out for that, which I cannot believe. So head over to a Likely Stories website and get yours quick. Oh, we are so excited. I can't believe we're just a few weeks away from that and just two weeks away from your launch. It's just, yeah, I feel like we've been talking about it for so long and here it is. It's here. And and we've all read it. We all love it. We are so excited for everyone to get their hands on this book and to officially kick off the holiday season, right? Christmas starts with MKA. That's right. All right. Now, without further ado, let's welcome our first guest of the evening, Deneen Milner. Deneen is a New York Times bestselling author, award-winning journalist, and director of the Deneen Milner Books imprint under the Simon & Schuster umbrella. She has written 30 books for adults, teens, and children, among them Around the Way Girl, a memoir with actress Taraji P. Henson, and Early Sunday Morning, a children's picture book. 
She is also the founder of MyBrownBaby.com, a critically acclaimed blog that examines the intersection of parenting and race. She's also the host of Speakeasy with Deneen, a podcast produced by Georgia Public Broadcasting. Like me, Deneen lives in Atlanta with her two daughters and their adorable golden doodle, Teddy. Her new oh. book. Yep. <laughs> Everybody's going to want to see that dog now. <laughs> I know. I know. Everybody's going to want to see Teddy. And her new book, One Blood, was just released last week. Uh, uh, Juan, can you bring Deneen on, please? Hi, Hi, hey Hi, everyone. Hey, Welcome. I'm afraid to pick up. It's Franklin, and I'm afraid to pick up Frankie because <laughs> we'll start barking. I was going to say she did not say Teddy. So I, Teddy, I, Teddy, yeah. was my, Teddy was my other golden. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. It's okay. I oh, love him. Man. I've actually had a couple of dreams about him over the last week. Oh, oh wow. wow. Yeah. This is my honey. Oh, so he's he here was my writing partner, so it makes sense oh. that he was showing up in my dreams yeah. as I was celebrating the release. As you're releasing. Awesome. And yeah. look, and now he's showing up with us. <laughs> and Franklin saying hi. Right, right. <laughs> well, Deneen, it is such a pleasure to speak with you tonight. And where do we even begin with you? So you have <laughs> so, so many publishing projects you've been involved in. But let's start tonight with One Blood, which is absolutely stunning in its scope, as it follows three women across three generations, from the turbulent 1960s all the way through to the present day. This book is nuanced and beautiful and sweeping, and Grace and Lolo and Ray all feel so distinct and alive in a way that makes me want to take a masterclass on character building with you, using this book as the textbook at the heart of it. I mean, it, it was, it, the characters were just so beautifully well done. So Deneen, can you tell us a little bit more about One Blood? And then one of our favorite questions here on Friends in Fiction, can you tell us what the book's really about at its heart? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a joy to be here with you guys, these Fantastic authors. It's I'm I'm overwhelmed being here with you. Uh, One Blood is my heart song. It's a story oh, about I like that. three women who are connected through adoption. One, a teenage mom who had a baby and had it taken away. The second is the adoptive mom who raised that child. And the third is that child as a mother, a grown-up mother in her own right. And really what it is about is these women sort of trying to find their way through all of these different systems to try to box them into what they think Black women should be, which is a wife, a mother, a servant, uh, just uh, a, someone who diminishes themselves without understanding who they, or the ability to be who they want to be. And the three of them are healing all of these different generational traumas to try to get free. And so mm -hmm. what you find with the three is just sort of an examination on motherhood, specifically on black womanhood um, and what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a friend and how they go about um, just sort of finding their freedom. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. Well, the research at the core of this novel must have been quite a feat because you deliver three completely different settings across three time periods and each comes alive with details that you get just right. So how did you decide that these were the time periods and places that you wanted to tackle and how did you dive into the research? So you asked me um, what the real sort of story is about and it's really about all of the questions that I wanted to ask my mom yes. when Ooh. she was alive. Um, she was a, a beautiful, strong black woman who was unable to have kids, who was married for almost 40 years before she passed away to the love of her life and who oh. dealt with some really serious issues that I never got to talk to her about because I was a kid when, oh. you know, when she was alive and then, right before she died, I had just become a mother in my own right. And I just saw the way that she was change. Wow. And I was so consumed with trying to raise a new baby and being pregnant with my second one that I never got to ask her questions about 
you know, things like, you know, how did you know that you were in love? How did you stay in love? What's menopause like? Like all of those different things. It's not fun. Yeah, right. And I, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, like we, you know, I think here in America, we don't really respect age and yeah. the fact that it's wrapped in wisdom. Yeah. And I wanted so much to ask my mom those questions. So because I didn't get to ask her in person, I got to ask her in this book. I and so the, the, in order to, um, you know, ask my mom those questions, I had to sort of set it in the period when she was alive. She was born in 1940 and she passed away in 2002. And oh. so I wanted to make sure that I understood how she lived, where she was raised, how she grew up. She grew up in South Carolina and what those, what happened in her life to grow her into a woman, to grow her into a wife, to grow her into a mother, and all those ways that that sort of poured into the kind of mother that she was to me. And then, I don't know if you all know this, but I'm adopted. I'm a child of adoption. I had no idea. I found oh, wow. out very much like Ray did in the book that at age 12, I found my adoption papers in my parents' oh. room. I was snooping because I'm nosy wow. like that. Oh. And um, and I never knew until during the, doing the research for this book who my birth mother mom, I actually, my birth mom was. So I actually found wow. my birth mother while researching this book. Um, oh, and wow. so it was a lot of reading about reproduction, reproduction specifically for Black women. Uh, I did a lot of research on the civil rights movement, on the baby scoop era, um, on uh, adoption, on hip hop in the 90s, New York wow. and the great migration wow. from the South to the North. There was just a lot of different ways that I had to pull in research in order to be accurate with the story. Wow. It was so well done. Wow. I mean, that's so interesting just to know, you know, where that came from. I think it makes mm -hmm. the story even richer. That's, that's incredible. What a journey for you. Wow. Yes, it was, it was something to, um, you know, to figure out that the hospital that I thought I was born in was actually a home for unwed mothers. Oh, and wow. This home for unwed mothers was chills, like famous for, 85% of the women who had babies there had their babies taken away <gasps> or coerced from their arms or, you know, just sort of surrendered. <sighs> and it was the night that I figured that out. I figured it out at like two o'clock in the morning. Um, and I just, you can see there's, there's a specific beginning of a um, of a chapter where you can see me bleeding all over the page because oh, it was just like wow. this information that I hadn't had that I got at age, I'll be 55 in a couple of weeks. I had gotten that, that information at age 53 that, oh, you know, oh, that I was born in this, in this hospital and that I was most likely taken away from my mother. And so that just sort of deepened the, the story oh. of grace um, and how she ended up having a baby and having that baby taken away from her and, and that journey of that child into the arms of an adopted mom. And then uh, at the choices that she makes as, uh, as a mother and whether or not those choices are based on nature or nurture. Wow. Or a little bit of both, right? Yeah, or a little bit of both. Right. I think, um, and, and, and motherhood is such a primal thing with us. And, and to find out that your mom, who you don't have, is not your birth mom, and then you have a birth mom. And to pour that all into this novel, no wonder you call it your heart song. Yeah, I get it now. I get it. <laughs> um, but you aren't just an author or a researcher or a podcaster or have a show. You're also a publisher, Denine. You make us look like such slackers. So <laughs> you, run, you run an imprint under Simon & Schuster, which is um, Christy, Kristen, and I are all under Simon & Schuster. And your imprint is called Deneen Milner Books. And on the imprint's website, it says, our focus is on books that highlight positive, well-rounded portrayals of Black children and families. Stretching beyond slavery, the civil rights movement, Black firsts, and celebrity. And I know the stated mission of Deneen Milner book is to celebrate the everyday humanity of Black children and families. 
I want you to talk to us about the imprint and why it's so important to you and maybe how the origin story of this imprint, how it came to be. Sure. So uh, I had my first baby when I was in 1999. And I knew that I wanted from the second that I like wiped that sonogram goop off of my belly and found out that she was a girl, <laughs> that I wanted to surround her with like lots of little pretty things and also um, a really clear understanding of who she is. Yeah. Uh, when mm. I was growing up, Black books were at a reserve, right? And there weren't a whole lot of people sort of pushing them into my hands. Yeah. I wanted something different for my daughter and for my daughters. I have two, one Mari, who's 24, and Lila, who's 21. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, immediately went to the bookstore looking for books and I couldn't find any books that sort of spoke to the everyday experience of what it means to be a kid but with black characters. And so, you know, there were no books about that I could put my hands on. This is not me saying that they didn't exist. But at the time, you know, there was no Amazon or bookshop.org or any kind of quick way to get just order a book at your fingerprints and have it show up on the door yeah. two days later. You literally had to go to the bookstore and you had to trust that they... The, whoever was buying the books at the bookstore was buying books that were, you know, good for the audience or that that we would want to buy. And very rarely did I find black books featuring black children and families. And so fast forward to when I started writing books, I couldn't I had stories that I wanted to write for children based on my interaction and my mothering with my own kids but I couldn't get them through the gates at, in the publishing industry. They just didn't get them. They didn't understand them at all. And so in 2016, I was still married. My ex-husband was writing a book for a, a small independent publisher out in uh, Chicago, Agate Publishing. And I talked my way into a dinner with them so I could pitch a children's book imprint to the publisher. And we showed up to the table and he says, you know, I wanted to talk to you because you run that website about black parenting. You have a natural audience of black parents with kids or parents raising black children. Right. And um, have you ever considered doing a children's book imprint? So we kind of showed up to the table. With wow. The That's um, amazing. And, and so we came out and we started publishing in 2017, had huge success. Um, particularly with this book called Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut. It's about a little boy who's, you know, proud to sit in the, the barbershop chair and, and get, you know, fresh, get good looking, get his hair cut and how proud he feels about it. And that book. <laughs> and that book. Your dog won, is very proud too. And, right, exactly. and, and that fresh. book won every major award there was to win that year. It won a Caldecott wow. um, honor, a Newberry honor, the oh. Kirkus award. Uh, and so, um, and then Simon and Schuster came along and they said, we really like what you're doing. Would you be interested in moving the imprint over here? And I said, yes. yes because it gave me the opportunity to have the infrastructure that wasn't necessarily together at Agate. It gave me more chance to give more money to the authors and illustrators that I wanted to work with um, yeah. and have the team set in place to be able to do the marketing of publicity and production that, um, you know, that I really wanted and saw for this imprint. And so it, it has been my heart's joy. It really has been such an amazing journey to be able to have a whole shelf of books, to be able to pick them up and hand them to children and then, you know, get giggly about, you know, for instance, Stella, which is a, a series on this little girl with these cute little Afro puffs. She's sort of like Eloise meets Olivia and she, oh, she just gets into all kinds of hijinks. Like, I want to keep the sun in the sky because I don't want to go to bed. And I and, and I want to eat ice cream and I you know want to play or my my friend is missing a tooth and who took it like you know these are kinds of things the kinds of books that I wanted to read to my kids when they were little but they just didn't exist yeah. and I couldn't put my fingertips on them so here we are that is awesome so you did something about it baby you yeah. did something about it it's amazing <laughs> yeah it's, it's a lot a lot of fun. 
Well, you know, you wear so many hats, you you need a bigger head because you've also, <laughs> you've also written these celebrity collaborations. I mean, you've worked with you co-authored Steve Harvey's two number one New York Times bestsellers, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, and Straight Talk, No Chaser, both of which became hit feature films. You've also co-written memoirs with Charlie Wilson, Taraji P. Henson, and more. You co-wrote Fresh Princess with, you know, Will Smith. Mm -hmm. Just that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. want to know <laughs> something, something that you said in our newsletter this week. You said, here's the thing. I'm not a secretary taking dictation while celebrities run their mouths. Amen to that, sister. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a former journalist myself, I know how much skill it takes to use someone else's words to craft a powerful story in their voice and to shape that story because, you know, you can tape, you can tape people talking, but taking what they say and shaping it into a real story. Could you talk to us a bit about the process of co-writing with these celebrities? Sure. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for saying that, because, you know, people really do think that it's easy to just sit down and talk to someone and then write a book. I am, <laughs> it is not me just no. sort of taking dictation and then handing it over to the publisher. A lot of uh, in all of my different uh, moments co-authoring with these celebrities, it the, the process involves us sitting down to figure out what the book is going to be about how we're going to tell it. Is it going to be a group of essays like what Taraji P. Henson's book is? Is it going to be sort of a straight narrative like Charlie Wilson's book is? Is it going to be an, an advice book like Steve Harvey's books are? Is it going to be sort of a memoir that pulls in a life and, and other people's lives like Cookie's book is? And so we have to sit down, we have to figure out what those what that book is going to be, how it's going to be told, and then come up with the chapters. And then it's really just me kind of showing up every day and wrestling two to three hours out of these celebrities every day. And then just sitting and talking to them about this one specific thing that we're going to talk about. So for instance, um, with Charlie Wilson, I really wanted to talk to him about the anatomy of some of his most popular music. Charlie Wilson was the, it's, is the uh, lead singer of the Gap Band. The Gap Band doesn't exist anymore. He's a, a solo artist now, but he was a part of the Gap Band. He was the voice of the Gap Band, very distinctive voice. And I wanted to know how, they created some of these songs. And so um, I, in the, I, it, it involved me talking to him about, well, who wrote it? Well, what was it like the, the night that you went into the studio and recorded it? Who had an attitude? Were you drunk? Hi. But, like, what was going on? And then Charlie Wilson sang, like anybody who knows me knows that two of my favorite songs are Outstanding and Yearning for Your Love, both by the Gap Band. And this man sang those songs in my ear and I literally had to stop wow. and say, okay, um, I know that I'm supposed to be, you know, just calm, cool and collected, but I just need a minute to be a fan. Oh, that's awesome. My song in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes it can get, um, it can get really intense. Again, with Charlie Wilson, Charlie Wilson spent a huge part of his career addicted. And so he was, he was addicted. He was addicted to cocaine. He had taken crack. He, you know, he was just out of it, homeless, living underneath a truck in a UP U-Haul uh, parking lot. And there would be times where I had to talk to him about what it was like for him to be high and how he had to pull himself out of that. And he would get so much into the conversation and get just a little bit keyed up about what it was like to be high that we would have to pull back. And he once said to me, like the, the journey to relapsing is as close to, you know, the bend of my elbow. And oh, so wow. we really have to be careful about how much we talk about this. And when he would get upset, I would have to spend, you know, like a half an hour at the end of that interview talking about things that brought both of us joy because it would be heavy and you're taking all of this in and it's a good thing, right? Because that has to show up on the page, but 
it could be really, really intense. Writing with Taraji was like talking to a girlfriend. It was like, oh. I wasn't working. It was We were just having a good time. Same thing with Cookie. And so it was just, and Jesse Norman. Oh, they, call, they call them, they call opera singers divas for a reason. So, um, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was, it That's was, awesome. it's, a, it's a lot of, a lot of work a lot of emotional and mental work research. I didn't know anything about yeah. opera when I when I wrote Jesse Norman's book. I had to teach myself that. But oh, that's a wow. part of the job. Oh, that's it's amazing. It, Janine, I wish we could talk to you for hours and hours more because I, I just, uh, <laughs> you are fascinating and I know these stories are so interesting and I want to dig into exactly how you do the ghostwriting thing. But unfortunately, we are out of time. We have to let you go. But I, you know, I do want to remind people out there, you gave us this great interview in our newsletter this week where you talked more about One Blood. You talked more about your perspective on life and on writing. And I really hope people will check that out. I, you, um, you particularly said something I loved about um, about uh, honoring your dreams and your subconscious, in which you were convinced your ancestors speak to you. So I I hope that um, I hope people will check that out. Before we let you go, Danine, can you tell us where readers can find you online and possibly on the road in the coming weeks? Absolutely. Uh, so I will be at Romans in Pasadena on Tuesday and then at the MLK Library in D.C. on Wednesday, the 20th, with the Well-Read Black Girl uh, uh, book club. And then I'll be in, oh, goodness, I'm in so many different places. It's, oh, in Chicago um, at Women and Children's First on the 26th. You can find me at My Brown Baby everywhere. And uh, I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook. And you can go on to my website, DaneenMilner.com. Wonderful, awesome. Deneen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. It was such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit. And we, you know, we loved One Blood. We we really hope people will pick it up. It's a, a beautiful, sweeping oh, big book that'll give you all the feels. Oh, <laughs> my God. Thank you. Baby. <laughs> say hi and stop barking. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me and Frankie. I had such a blast with you. It really is. This is such a beautiful platform, such an amazing place for us writers to come and talk about what we love. And that's the written word. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Thanks very what much. What a pleasure. Bye. All right, ladies, quickly before we get to Jessica Ward, she was so amazing. And I loved what she said earlier about the importance of finding ourselves in books and being able to recognize ourselves in books, which yeah. was something that helped her start her imprint. Mm -hmm. Quickly, was there a time in your childhood that you found yourself in a book? And how important was that to you? How about you, Patty? Oh, I mean, I talk all the time on the road about how books saved me in the four years where I went to four different schools. But if I'm going to pick one, I would say Little Women because I read it over and over and over. And even though it was in a completely different time period, Jo and her kind of quick temper and how she didn't feel like she fit in and yeah. she loved books and writing, I saw myself and thought, it's not so bad. So yeah, that's absolutely. what I would say. How, how about you, Mary Kay? You know, um, it's such a, a different time and everything else, but Little House on the Prairie. You know, Laura Ingalls wanted to write stories and she was a middle sister of three sisters. And um, I think I saw a little bit of myself in her. I love that. Yeah, that is that is how I felt about the Diary of Anne Frank. I read it for the first time when I was probably 11 or 12, just a little bit younger than she was when she was writing the diary. And um, I saw so much of myself and my own thoughts and my own hopes and my own fears and her experience. And it, um, I, I think it's one of the reasons why her diary has been read by so many people. I, I think it's just mm -hmm. something that transcends um, time and place and, and just reminds us of our own humanity, which I think is, is so important. How about you, Christy? Um, well, if, if I think about something that I just read over and over and over again, when I was young, it was Matilda. I loved that book. So I much. Love that book. Um, there's something about Matilda that I think I related to, like in a way that I couldn't even, I mean, obviously that she loved books and so did I, but also Matilda was like this little girl that figured out how to write her own story and carve her own path, but she was very like quiet and polite about it. 
And I love yeah. that about her, you know? Like she found her own power, but it was in this like really like lovely sort of way. So anyway, I don't That's know. Awesome. I love, love just it. like you. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it like that, but I just, you know, I think when you're a little girl and I don't know, there's something about that little girl like finding her own kind of yeah. power that you don't you you're a little girl, so you don't know that you can have power in the world, right? So true. Yep. Anyway, so true. Yeah. That Not makes me think about Eloise. I read oh, Eloise, yes, I love and Eloise. I can remember what I loved about Eloise was that she was bossy and subversive, and ordered yeah. people around. And there was there was no. <laughs> I just wanted to be Eloise Same. and live in the plaza. Adorable. Hotel. I wanted yeah. to live in the Plaza Hotel and have a, a, a turtle <laughs> and a dog named Skipperdy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> weenie, Skipperdy and Weenie. I mean, that's yeah. the best. Yeah. And nanny. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Um, so fun. Let us know in the comments what was a book that you loved when yeah. you were that you All saw right. yourself in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now let's welcome Jessica Ward. So Jessica Ward is a pseudonym for the number one New York Times bestselling author who has written 60 novels, including the wildly popular Black Dagger Brotherhood series. You all know her as J.R. Ward. There are more than 20 million copies of Ward's novels in print worldwide, and they have been published in 27 different countries around the world. And Jessica and I are agency sisters, agent sisters, which is <laughs> almost like being sisters, but not. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't borrow each other's clothes. <laughs> no, we've never actually met in person, so, but not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. After graduating from law school, Jessica began working in healthcare in Boston and spent many years as chief of staff of one of the premier academic medical centers in the nation. Writing has always been her passion and her idea of heaven is a whole day of nothing but her computer, her dog and her coffee pot. Oh, that does sound oh, delightful. Yeah. <laughs> Jessica enjoys spending time in the Adirondacks and lives in the South with her family and her dogs. Her new book, The St. Ambrose School for Girls, was released in July by Gallery Books, which is the publishing imprint that also publishes Christy, Christie's books and mine. So I don't know that that really makes us sisters, but we are we are all connected. She's Gallery. We're all connected. She was born to be one of us. That's right. <laughs> Juan, could you bring Jessica on? please. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Jessica. I am so not over Deneen's dog. Like, right. I, I oh. oh, that baby got on and I was just like, oh, oh, I just want to love you. I, just <laughs> I know I wanted to like snap a picture because we just cannot seem to get salt a good haircut consistently. <laughs> such a good doodle cut. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Jessica, we are so excited that you're here. We are so thrilled to talk to you about this just propulsive new book of yours, um, the St. Ambrose School for Girls. I just flew through and we all love so much. So this novel centers around Sarah, a girl recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder, who finds herself as a scholarship student who doesn't quite fit in an exclusive all-girls boarding school. As soon as she arrives, she becomes the target for Greta, the most popular and most malicious girl in school. Sarah is more than determined not to let Greta get to her, but when someone ends up dead, everything changes. So that's just a little bit about what this novel is about. So can you tell us a little more? And then in friends in fiction fashion, can you tell <laughs> us what it's really about? Um, so I think that that summary actually covers things nicely because there's a lot that I can't say without giving things away. Yeah, um, okay. What the book's really about is when you're an outsider, um, and you have secrets to keep, how do you find your support system? How do you, mm -hmm. uh, make your way when you're 15 years old? Mm -hmm. Um, like, I, you know, I have a daughter and I think part of the reason why this book came to me is because, I mean, we've all been 15 or we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here. Um, and I think watching her and her friends sort of has taken me back to my own, um, adolescence and being at a prep school. Um, but Sarah M. Taylor came to me in a dream and I woke up and I had the image of this black haired girl with a desperate expression on her face and black clothes and I just had to know about her I had to I had to figure out why it was so vivid and she came out of water so I was closing my eyes and I, I was dreaming and and she came up out of water and she looked at me 
And I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, and I literally jacked up in bed and I was like, I don't know what that was. And then I started to think about what she looked like. And that was when I got the gates to the school. And then um, the images, that's how I write is I have um, movies that play in my head and my job is to transcribe what I'm shown, oh. put it in a good order and then just like transcribe. And so I just went with the image of those gates and then the drive up and then, you know, she was at Telmer Hall and then I saw the mother's car and then the mother got out and I saw what she was wearing. And I smelled the, you know, the fake Giorgio perfume and I just Ooh. went down this rabbit hole and it, it, I wrote it the first draft in three weeks, about three and a half years ago. And then no I, no, wow. Wow. Oh my that goodness. That is unbelievable. That is incredible. So now, Jessica, the setting in this novel, the St. Ambrose School for Girls, comes so vividly alive for the reader from the moment Sarah's mother lands on the lawn and right on through. Can you tell us what you were trying to achieve with this setting and how you drew it so expertly? Okay, so I'm going to fail this, the, the answer to this question. Okay. okay. There's, there's, no there's no failing. failing. There's no, no failing. Fail. Fail. I don't think of any of my books. I don't, there's no, nothing that I construct. There are no points that I bring to bear on any of this. Okay. I have pictures in my head and my job is to present the pictures on the page in such a fashion that the reader can approximate the movies that I'm being shown. So I don't make anything up. I'm not that smart. I, I am merely a typist. And the only influence I have over anything is the order in which I put the scenes. But other than that, it, I, I, that setting was where she went to school. There, there is no point to it. It just is. Wow. Um, so, you know, I feel no, like, but, I should, well, you know, if I feel like if I, if I gave you the right answer, it would be like, well, you know, I was trying to do this. And I was, <laughs> there yeah. is no right. I think you it's like, fascinating. It just showed yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're giving us the answer that's making us very jealous because yeah. it would be very. Yes, I wish I could write I, I my books that way. I actually think my books would be better if there was <laughs> a cognitive process brought to bear yeah. with them. Um, because I really, and I don't have any control. If I try and control the pictures, if I try and dictate what the stories do, I, I they, then all the pictures go goodbye and all of the voices shut up and I have nothing. It's a black hole. That's the only time I get writer's block is when I try and dictate anything so as yeah. long as I sit back and I'm essentially the first reader and I just type, then everything goes well. Do you think wow. your own experiences feed into your subconscious to kind of, to have these images come out? Like, like for example, was there something about your own schooling experience that might've fed into your subconscious and created the movie behind the scenes? You'd have to ask my subconscious. I, I, really, <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't okay. know. This is why it's I, awesome. This is, why yeah. I, this is why I suck at interviews because like, <laughs> I feel like, oh, <laughs> this is fascinating. Like, I feel like, okay, so Patty, as my, my older, smarter, better sister, would have a ah. constructed answer to that that would just like blow everyone away about <laughs> how like wonderfully intelligent she is. And I'm just like, look, I got Rice Krispies, I type. That's what I got. And so frequently <laughs> interviews kind of suck because I don't have any, you know. Not at all. Yeah. No, this is it's your own fascinating. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I could use some Jessica. help from your, from your subconscious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If your subconscious would like to show some movies to me, I, I am, I will buy Because well, Here's the thing. Like you could make the argument that, yes, I do think a lot about teenage girls now that I have one. Yeah. Um, but like. I, I, I was a Stephen King fan, but I don't have anything in common with vampires. There's nothing in, as my best friend says, I'm not cool enough to write the Black Dagger Brotherhood books. I mean, like I don't have tattoos. I mean, I, I don't think you want to give me a gun because God only knows what would happen and it would not be anything <laughs> intentional. Like I'm not, you know, I am competitive. I am an athlete, but other than that, I don't have anything in common with them either. I've never owned a pair of leather pants. Okay. <laughs> Now, we're going to all chip her. in and we're all going to get you a pair. I'm just sorry. <laughs> that's something that's going to have to happen. You're going to get a box in the mail from Friends in Fiction. You're going to be like, what Past is collection that? Plates. Yeah. And it's going to be leather pants, but no gun. We don't want you to. <laughs> no, 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 no. But no, we think, I mean, I think it's fascinating because if you line all of us up and talk about our process, all of us have such, even among the four of us now add you and your movies, like, crazy different processes. And I think 
the creative act is the creative act. It comes to us the way it comes to us and there's no right and there's no wrong. And that's so, actually when, when people come up to me and they say, well, you know, I want to be J.R. Ward, you know, like it, what, what do I do to get there? Um, I tell them that it, it, it is, I tell them exactly that there, there is only the right answer for me. The right answer for any other person is going to be different because we are all are yes. different. The only commonality that I see among successful authors is that we tend to write every day or yes. essentially every day. And if we're not actively drafting or working on a project, we we're thinking like, yeah. in, you know, like, I, I actually write every day, but like I'm or, I'm parallel processing like three different books right now in my head, you know. Yep. It, and and if we're not working, we're thinking about working. No. Yes. And I always say the four of us have said this, which is, what do other people think about? You do. <laughs> like, what do they, what do they think what about? What do other people think? When they're like about? drifting out, like when their husband's driving and they're looking out the window and kind of like, like what are they thinking about? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my know. gosh. That's funny. Okay, I have to, I'm going to read a quote of something you said. You said, this book, the St. Ambrose School for Girls, had to be written. I had to get her, her and her story out of my head and now the movie so she would leave me alone. And I love this so much because I think all of us have had that experience of a story mm -hmm. that won't let us go. But this is different than your paranormal romances. Well, and it was just announced earlier you know, this year. Because you know Meg. Yeah. You can imagine yep. the joy, okay? When I, so I never bother <laughs> That her. was my question. What did Meg say? I never bother her because like, I'm always like, I don't want to be a pain in the ass and I don't want to cause any problems and I want to take care of my own problems as much as I can. So I emailed her and I said, hi, I'm, this was about probably two years ago. And I was like, hi, I'm really sorry to bother you, but if you have a minute to like give me a call today, like whatever. Like literally 30 seconds after I hit send, she's yep. like, are you dead? Is this sick? What's going on? Because like, I never yeah. bother her. So she was like, and I said, I'm glad to know that you have are an optimist like I am, you know, because I always think <laughs> well, if someone needs something, it's a dire thing. I said, I said, Meg, I said, I'm so sorry. And she like, I could, because you have happy Meg voice and then you have yep. happy Meg voice and it's yep. a pretty binary thing. And I, I usually <laughs> get the happy Meg voice, but then all of a sudden I got, she said, okay, what did you do? Because she knows with my mouth, there's like no filter. So <laughs> who knows what the hell is going to, you know, I was interviewed by Chris Rice over this weekend and he goes, you know, usually I prepare things, but he said with you, I never know what you're going to do. And I said, Chris, I never know what I'm going to do. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, I said, I'm so sorry. I've written a book. And there was this pause and she goes, Yeah. Like, that's what you do. You write books. And I said, no, I wrote this book. And I said, and she goes, oh, God, she figured I'd given it to my editor, which I'm perfectly capable of doing something stupid like that. And so I said, you know, I explained to her what it was. And she and Rebecca read it um, and then sent it around the agency. And I was very grateful for all of their feedback. It, it was just one of those things that I was so compelled to write that I got up two hours early and I'm already an early riser. Um, I was still under deadline about everything. And I worked on it for three years, getting wow. up and making sure that I had a little extra time every single day to put into this thing that I loved so much. Wow. That's oh, awesome. Oh, I love that. And what made you go from, what made you say you weren't going to call this a J.R. Ward book? Right. You know, what, was there some thought? What, did you have that discussion with her? What, what made you go from, okay, now this is a Jessica book? Well, first of all, like my books write, like, oh, I don't know how to say this. Um, that's the way the book wrote. So I'm a control okay. freak. Like, like I'm a control freak. I'm a highly disciplined individual, like seven days a week, no vacations. I, I'm like really intense and like whatever. The writing is the only place in my, my life where I'm out of control, which is the irony. So when oh. an idea or a book comes, what point of view, like, it tells me it, it just is what it is. And so when I sat down, Sarah just was like, I was looking through her eyes and usually in scenes I have, like, if there are three people in the scene, I can look at the scene out of this person's eyes, hear their thoughts, experience what they're experiencing, interdigitate with those other two. And then I can replay the scene back and look at it from this person. And I've got their internal monologue about everything and their clothes and whether the room is too hot for them or too cold for them. And so I can, I can play the scenes back. 
Sarah's scenes were only ever from Sarah's point of view. So, and I'd never read first person before. Well, no, there's one short story that I wrote. There's first person. And so she was, she just, that was the way she wanted me to see it. And that's the way I typed. Wow. Amazing. Okay. You just played into my question. Sarah's mental health struggles in this book are very much on display. She's having a difficult time controlling her bipolar disorder and hiding the lithium she takes to manage it from the other girls, which has to be a really lonely feeling. Now, you said in an interview that I was always aware, you said I was always aware that I was neuroatypical. And boy, I remember trying to assimilate so vigorously because I didn't want anybody to know. And you mentioned knowing that other people were hiding bits and pieces of themselves to try to fit in, which I think we see in Sarah. Um, Were any of your own experiences filter into the crafting the um, character of Sarah? Um, No, again, she just is who she is. Um, Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, so I was diagnosed um, with Asperger's, which is a term they don't use anymore. It's your own spectrum. Oh, they don't? Okay. Uh, No. No, they don't. It's now considered you are on the spectrum. And um, so when I was a kid, the isol- there were things that I saw through Sarah's eyes that viscerally I remembered. Mm-hmm. But it was so, so the idea of like, so for example, I have something called facial blindness. So I can't see faces. I've trained myself to be able to recognize what faces look like and identify people, but like what emotions look like on faces. I had to learn that it it was, it was like being an alien around in another world where everyone else was on the same bandwidth, but I was like outside looking in. So there, when I went through some of the scenes with Sarah, I remember being that kid and being lost in what, I should have fit in with. Um, And so I really, yes. So from what the pictures were showing me, there were things that I remember from my own childhood, but it wasn't like I portrayed them in any way. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Definitely. What do you think that your readers will take away from, from seeing Sarah's struggles on the page? Because they're just there and you don't hide them. Um, Well, I will tell you one thing. When there is a scene in the beginning, the first quarter of the book where she ends up in the shower and can't remember how she got there. And when I was drafting the first draft, I ended up in the shower with her and I'm like, how did we get here? I'm like, what the heck's going on? I had no idea that she had bipolar. So as soon as I realized that her relationship with reality was very, um, tenuous, I stopped and I took a big step back from the project because I have a real problem with people who are trying to represent experiences they haven't lived. Right. And I think to use bipolar or a bipolar diagnosis as a plot device is just incredibly disrespectful and ignorant. So mm-hmm. I took a big step back for, for a little bit. And then I, I really thought to myself, okay, I'm just going to write the first draft and get it down. And then I'm going to figure out what to do with it. And I actually did the research while I was, after I kind of gotten it all on the page, then I did the research about how was bipolar treated in 1990? Like, you know, what, what, and then I actually went and I interviewed people who had it and I had them read the book because I wanted to make sure that I was handling it in an appropriate manner. Right. Um, Wow. Great respect. And so anyway, so I, you know, Again, I saw parts of myself in it as someone who had, you know, I I still say Asperger's, although I shouldn't, um, who is autistic. Like, you know, I heard numbers. So when I added things, they were tones that I was adding, not actual numbers. And so I, I was used to like having this weird relationship with reality, not in a bipolar fashion, but in a way that like how my brain inter internalized normal stimuli was very different than everyone else. So I don't know. Oh, so what do I want readers to walk away from? I don't want them to walk away from anything. I would never, ever tell anyone to have anything. Uh, that, that is an individual path that every reader takes with any book that they read. I do think that people are going to see when they were an outsider. Mm. Like from people who have read the book, what I hear most is 
I was an outsider because of this, whether it was their sexuality, whether it was a mental health diagnosis, whether it was an eating disorder, whether it was something in their family that they felt isolated them. And I do think that that's part of our developing our identities as young girls and, and going in and becoming adults is somehow reconciling these fault lines that take us away from normal. Okay. Which is bullshit because no one's normal, but like no take one. from like, you know, the script of what's supposed to be normal and, and how do we find our support troops and how do we, how do we grow as individuals, you know? And how yeah. do we feel compassion for ourselves? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. that's a big one. Mm, it's incredible. Well, the spoke was incredibly well done. And I, I think I can speak for all of us that your process is incredible and yeah. Really, um, yeah. I wish we had so much more time to talk to you. Um, but unfortunately we are going to have to wrap up for the night, but we just want to thank you so much for sharing this incredible novel with us, Jessica. Thank we you. Hope that everyone will run out and purchase their copy of the St. Ambrose School for Girls, um, either at their local bookstore or um, at our bookshop.org page. And we just thank you for sharing your time. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very grateful. Oh, Jessica, it was so thank fun you, to Jessica. meet you. It was, so thank you. it was so much fun. All right. Do I just click out? Yep. Juan's got you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Don't forget that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We'll be back next week with our friends, Sarah Pekinen and Etoff Room. We had such a fun episode in store for you and we cannot wait. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us for these incredible guests. And we will see you next week. Same time, same place. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.